Welcome to the SUNY Child Protection Policies Training. This is Module 6, Campus, University Affiliate, and System Administration Responsibilities. The responsibilities of each campus university affiliated organization and system administration under the Child Protection Policy are listed in Section G of the policy. There are nine primary responsibilities. Number one, developing local procedures to implement the Child Protection Policy. Two, identifying any applicable exceptions to the one-on-one -on -one prohibition, which will be discussed further. Three, designate a responsible university official for each covered activity. Four, communicate the policy requirements to all covered persons. Five, conduct training upon implementation of the policy and biennially thereafter. Six, develop procedures to handle sex offender registry searches. Seven, develop a mechanism for reporting child sexual and physical abuse. Eight, develop a mechanism for investigating reports of of covered persons. We will now review each of these requirements individually. Campus procedures. A campus, including the university affiliate and system administration, must develop procedures to implement the child protection policy. The local policies and procedures can supplement, but, be mu but must be no less stringent than the child protection policy. Two, identify any applicable exceptions to the one-on-one -on -one prohibition. The child protection policy prohibits one-on-one -on -one contact between adults and children. In other words, adults may not be alone with children. The local procedures developed to implement the policy may, however, create exceptions to the one-on-one -on -one prohibition if such exceptions are warranted. For example, are there any pedagogical reasons why it may be permissible for one-on-one -on -one contact, such as tutoring or music lessons? Similarly, are there any health-related reasons why an exception may be appropriate, such as speech therapy or medical, dental, or optical services? In implementing local procedures, consider any appropriate exceptions to the one-on-one -on -one prohibition and clearly identify them. Number three, designate responsible university officials. Each campus, university affiliate, and system administration must designate a responsible university official for each covered activity. This slide represents that concept. The responsible university official, and of course there may be more than one, is an official designation and is clearly identified. The designation of responsible university officials may be made in various ways. A single responsible university official may be designated for all covered activities, or several responsible university officials may be designated for a single activity or for several activities. Bottom line, each covered activity must have a designated official. Campuses, university affiliates, and system administration should determine which administrators or which offices will be responsible for designating responsible university officials. The administrators or offices that perform the designation should own the function of formal designation so that the line of responsibility is clear. In this slide are examples of how various offices might make designations. The Student Affairs Office, for example, might be responsible to, to designate all responsible university officials for covered activities that are part of academic programs. The Athletics Department might be responsible for designating responsible university officials for covered activities that are part of athletic programs. Alternatively, the Office of the Vice President might be responsible for designating responsible university officials for all covered activities, regardless of whether they are athletic, academic, or fall into other categories. Number four, campuses, university affiliates, and system administration must communicate the policy requirements to covered persons. Covered persons, as we already discussed, are those individuals in the following five categories. One, employees of the university or university affiliate. Two, students of the university. Three, volunteers of the university or university affiliate. Four, third-party approved vendors. And five, 
employees, agents, and volunteers of the third-party approved vendors. The communication requirement to covered persons in categories one through three is met by training, which we will discuss shortly. The requirements of the policy are communicated to covered persons in categories four and five by providing them with a copy of both child protection policies and obtaining their acknowledgement of receipt of those policies, which will also be further discussed. Five, develop and conduct training. Campuses, university affiliates, and system administration must develop training programs that contain the contents of this training as well as a campus-specific local training module. The local training must identify the responsible university officials. It must identify the mechanisms that will be used for reporting child abuse. It must identify the designated contact for the university police, and it must review all local policies and procedures that have been developed to implement the child protection policy, such as, for example, how sex offender registry searches will be conducted. The sixth responsibility of the campuses, university affiliates, and system administration is that they must implement sex offender registry searches. Both the New York Sex Offender Registry and the National Sex Offender Registry searches must be conducted on covered persons who are employees, volunteers, or students of the state university or a university-affiliated organization. A search of the New York State Sex Offender Registry means a search of the file of persons required to register pursuant to Article 6C of the Correction Law maintained by the New York Division of Criminal Justice Services pursuant to New York Correction Law Section 168B for every level of sex offender, level one through level three, which requires an email, CD, or hard copy submission of names and identifiers to DCJS as described on the DCJS website. And there is the link to the DCJS website. A search of the National Sex Offender Public Registry means a search by first and last name of the National Sex Offender Public Website maintained by the U.S. Department of Justice at this link. And uh, the link is provided. The local procedures must designate offices or individuals that are responsible for conducting the sex offender registry searches on the covered persons who are employees, volunteers, or students of the university the university affiliate, and system administration. Those searches must be conducted before the start of a covered activity. A custodian of the registry search results must also be assigned. Sex offender registry searches must be retained for six years after the covered person has separated from employment or from the university. Important notes. Sex offender registry searches are not criminal background checks. The sex offender registry websites are publicly available. Consent by the covered person to perform a sex offender registry search is not required. If a sex offender registry search yields a positive result, that person cannot participate in a covered activity. Sex offender registry searches must be conducted not more than 90 days before the commencement of a covered activity to ensure that the results are current. This slide provides a graphic representation of the requirement for sex offender registry searches. Over on the left, you see part one of the covered person definition, and then the plus sign leads to part two of the definition, the identification of covered persons by category, and sex offender registry searches must be conducted on all of these covered persons. However, for the first three categories of covered persons, the university conducts the searches, or the university affiliate or system administration. For categories four and five, that is third parties and their employees, agents, and volunteers, the third party conducts their own searches. The seventh responsibility of the campuses, university affiliates, and system administration is to provide a mechanism for reporting child sex and physical abuse. There must also be a mechanism in place for reporting retaliation claims. 
On the right side of this slide is an example of a reporting mechanism. Uh, mechanism. It lists who to contact, their office locations, their phone numbers, and a website contact, and it also provides the same information for the responsible university officials. The eighth responsibility of campuses, university affiliates, and system administration is to implement procedures to investigate claims of child sexual and physical abuse and retaliation claims. The university police must promptly investigate the reports and prepare written findings. If the investigation results in a finding of reasonable cause to believe a crime was committed, the university police department must coordinate with other law enforcement officials in accordance with the campus's local policy. The child protection policy prohibits retaliation against good faith reporting, good faith investigation or response to allegations of physical or sexual abuse, and good faith reporting of noncompliance with the policy. Examples of potentially retaliatory acts include adverse employment actions affecting salary, promotion, job duties, work schedules, and or work locations actions negatively impacting a student's academic record or progress, and any action affecting the campus environment, including harassment and intimidation. Finally, campuses, university affiliates, and system administration are responsible to provide for the appropriate identification of covered persons. Covered persons must wear and display prominently at all times during the covered activity a lanyard or other form of identification that identifies the individual as a covered person in the program or activity in which they are participating. The ID should be event specific and include the event name, the date, and the covered person's name, photograph, and role. This picture provides an example. You can see the name and photo of Christy Thomas, who is a coach in the Summer Girls field hockey camp. The dates are shown. Why do we want a picture ID? Because shirts, uniforms, hats, and other attire and non-photo IDs can be easily duplicated or misappropriated. We want to ensure that the ID is specific to this person for this particular activity so that there is no risk of misappropriation or duplication. What identification is not appropriate? A t-shirt that has no picture of the covered person, no date for the covered activity, for example. Uh, none of these are adequate because they can be easily uh, duplicated or misappropriated. This concludes module.